All right, thank you for, uh, for the introduction and for this opportunity to share some of my, some of the research that actually we've done. So Dr. Root is a, a collaborator on this project um, where we've looked at the effects of trace mineral supplementation on performance, immune response, and carcass quality of at-risk mineral deficient cattle. So a couple things before we get started. Uh, the first is um, feel free to interrupt. So if you have a question and you wanna talk about it at this time, then feel, feel free to interrupt me at any point during the presentation. Um, the other thing is we are going to replicate this study either late this summer or early next fall, so in 2021. Um, so as we're talking about this, if you think of anything that we can change or other things that you would want to look at or things that might be useful or helpful to the people that you've talked to or that you've worked with. Um, kind of keep that in, in mind and let me know if you think of anything because we, ha we have a little bit of freedom in how, in how we do that study. So, um, okay, so a little bit of background about this project. Um, so, the main cause of morbidity or sickness and mortality or death in feedlot cattle is disease. And most feedlots are gonna average anywhere from five to 15% morbidity, but there are some that report upwards of 44% morbidity um, in their receiving feedlot cattle. And at times, depending, morbidity can actually be more costly to a producer um, in morta than mortality because of the cost and the time associated with treating the sick animal. And then also um, the, the decreased performance that they're gonna see in the animal and then the, de the decrease in carcass quality. And so mor morbidity, especially when you have it reports upwards of 44%, it can have a huge impact on a producer. So along the same lines of, oh, Along the same lines as that, we know that trace mineral status is essential in both animal health and performance. And because of the way that we raise and produce a lot of our cattle in the state of Utah, so a lot of cow-calf producers, if they calve in the spring, they will uh, they'll calve and then keep their animals around for a little bit and then they'll kick them out on pasture. And depending on what type of pasture they're on, especially if they're down on some of that rough range that we see in southern Utah or down near Arizona Strip area, or even if they have them up here in the, the north kind of out on those, that sagebrush you find by, by Snowville, um, there, there aren't a lot of options for mineral supplementation there. And so because of the production system that we use in Utah, it's not uncommon for our our calves when they're weaned to be deficient in minerals. And the four trace minerals that we commonly see that are deficient in the state of Utah are going to be copper, zinc, selenium, and manganese. And so because we have these mineral deficient calves, what we what we know or what we what we don't know actually is we don't know the best practices for our feedlot producers to employ when they receive calves that might be or that have a known mineral deficiency. And so because we don't have any known best practices for receiving these mineral deficient feeder calves, then what we need to know is we need to know what to tell our producers to, to do or as, as producers, we need to know what to do. So just a little bit more of background on trace mineral status. Um, so we talked a little bit on the last slide about feedlot performance and how feedlot performance and carcass quality are decreased um, when an animal has a low trace mineral status and that's mainly due to the impact on the immune system just because the body is going to shuttle more energy towards the immune system than it is towards production. And so we, we don't see as much production. And then if an animal gets sick, then obviously we're going to see a decreased production as well. Um, the other thing is with immune response in receiving calves, they, they already are, even if they are adequate in trace mineral status, they are also somewhat immune challenged just due to the stress that comes oftentimes, unless they're backgrounded, oftentimes 
once they're weaned, they're still stressed from the weaning pr process. They've been transported. Now we co-mingle them with other calves that might have been, been exposed to other diseases. So it's regardless of their trace mineral status, it's a challenging time for the immune system of any animal. And um, when they have a decreased trace mineral status, that compounds the, the, those challenges that they're having. The other thing is if their trace mineral status isn't adequate, then it can also impact their vaccine response. So even though you have calves that you get into your feedlot and you vaccinate them upon receiving, they might not respond to those vaccines if they don't have an adequate immune system or an adequate trace mineral status because their immune system won't be functioning and allowing them to, um, to respond to that vaccine. And then the other part of this that all of these things kind of work together is um, stress. So um, stress impacts both feedlot performance and carcass quality. And all receiving calves are going to have some level of, of stress. And this stress is going to have an even bigger, an even bigger physiological effect on the animal when it's trace mineral deficient. And so there's kind of this, this whole, whole point of this, this information, I suppose, is that there's this intimate relationship between uh, feedlot performance, carcass quality, immune response, and stress. And so we have to think about all of these different things and how they work together. And if an animal doesn't have an adequate trace mineral status, it is going to affect all, all four of these things here. So a little bit more background on the, the four uh, trace minerals that are commonly deficient in the, the Inner Mountain West or that we see deficient in Utah. And that's going to be copper, zinc, selenium, and manganese. And essentially all four of these trace minerals that are commonly deficient in this area all have a link to the immune system. And so if we don't see, if we see a decreased level of copper, that results in an increased risk of infection because it affects both neutrophils and phagocytes. Um, zinc is a little bit of a, I guess a side note is I study zinc and how different levels of zinc impact growth of muscle cells grown in culture. And the more that I read about zinc, the more I realize it is literally involved in everything within the body. I, I swear that zinc has to be a part of, a part of everything. But um, it's actually part of uh, over 1,000 different proteins in the body. Um, in addition to just being a part of nearly all of the machinery that's used for, for metabolism, um, if an animal's deficient in zinc, then we know that it affects feed intake and growth rate and feed efficiency. It also influences T cells and B, B cells as well in the immune system. Um, selenium is really important with the uh, formation and activity of natural killer cells, um, helper T cells, and cytotoxic, C, cytotoxic T cells. And manganese is also really important. Um, they don't, they haven't been able to pin down exactly which immunological system manganese impacts, but they do know that if an animal is deficient in manganese, that it does have impaired immunity and it also impacts central nervous system function. And then manganese also plays a really important role in oxidative, oxidative processes within the cell. And we know that the immune system and different oxidative processes within the cell are very, clo very closely linked and related to, to one another. So hopefully that provides a little bit of background on what we did and um, or why, why we're doing this. So essentially why we're researching this is we had producers approach us here at USU and um, one of the producers had mineral deficient calves. And so he got these, he received these, these mineral deficient calves. He didn't know they were mineral deficient he treated them like every other calf that he receives. And he had, uh, I think he said upwards of 
50% morbidity in those animals. So about 50% of them were getting sick. Um, he went back and he did a little bit of research and he found out that these calves were coming out of California. Um, and they had come out of California during the, the drought. And so the drought had obviously impacted a number of things in California. But one of the things that it impacted um, was the, the soil, which then impacts the trace mineral status of the plants. And then if these animals aren't supplemented, then they're going to be more mineral deficient than originally thought. So he was seeing increased morbidity and mortality rates. This was, we hypothesize, was likely due to a low vaccine response because he had received them, he had, had vaccinated them, he had done everything that he normally does, um, but he saw a number of animals get sick. Um, he also saw a, a decreased feedlot performance. And so he called us and wanted to know um, what can he do in the future when he receives these trace mineral deficient cows? How, how can he help them so that they aren't, he doesn't experience these large rates of morbidity and mortality? And we looked through the, the literature and we realized we didn't have any answers for him. And so then we put together um, a Western Fair proposal and we were funded and we were able to, to look at kind of what, um, what to do. And so hopefully that, that this research, although it's only one project we're planning to replicate it again, hopefully provides a little bit of information that producers can use to figure out what to do either when they're receiving mineral deficient cattle or if they want to just make sure they can try to employ some of these things to improve, improve performance. So kind of in general, the, the research question we had is when producers receive these mineral deficient cattle, what should they do? And this is especially pertinent in the state here where we have Southern Utah where cattle are out on pretty rough range. Um, and then just in general, kind of the, how we range our cattle here in the state. So what we did in this initial study is we took 40 moderately mineral deficient Angus influence steers. Um, I say they were moderately mineral deficient, so they were managed um, here at Utah State University by, by our beef herd, and they, they were out on some range, and they weren't, they weren't supplemented with mineral but the quality of the forage they're on was slightly higher than some of the other minerals that we see um, than the other forages that we see in other areas. So they, they were deficient in um, copper and selenium, but they had adequate amounts of manganese and zinc. And so um, that's what I mean when I say that they were moderately mineral deficient. Um, they also averaged um, just Logistically, we put in a grow safe and had some construction at our beef unit. So we weren't able to start this trial until the steers were about 800 pounds. So they were, were a little bit bigger. What we did is we took these 40 moderately mineral deficient Angus influenced animals. We put them on a truck for four hours to emulate travel stress. Um, so I'm sure you can imagine how interesting it was to call the trucker and tell him we want him to pick up our 40 steers and drive them around for four hours and then bring them back to us. So he, I think on the invoice he wrote, took steers for a ride. So I thought that was, that was pretty, pretty entertaining. But um, we, we traveled them for four hours for uh, transport stress. We then brought them back and we split them up into four different groups. So we had our control animals, which we didn't provide any supplemental mineral to. Uh, we had those that we gave one injection of multi-min. Um, and then we had two others where we provided um, industry levels of mineral. So the, the producer that, that contacted us initially, he actually provided the, the mineral. And so we used the one that, that he provided. And so it meets, um, so it meets and or exceeds all of the NRC requirements for, for trace minerals. So we gave that to the animals orally. And then we tried um, a fourth treatment where we gave them twice the amount. So we just orally supplemented two times those industry levels of mineral. So we had these 40 animals. And then uh, we fed them in the grow safe system. We 
looked at these treatments for the, um, so we gave these treatments for the first 40 days. So kind of to see what producers should do initially. We don't want to have to do something forever in the feedlot, which they're not in there forever. But we, we just looked at this in general for the first 40 days. And then we, after that time, then we just uh, tracked feedlot performance and gave them uh, a ration and an oral mineral and industry level. So we looked at their feedlot performance. We looked at liver mineral concentration. So we collected liver samples on days uh, 0, 5, 10, 20, 30, and 40 of the trial. Uh, we also collected um, blood to measure immune response. So Dr. Bart Tarbett in our antiviral group, um, he, did, he did some work. And uh, then we also, at the end of the trial, we sent the animals to harvest at a commercial facility and we assessed carcass quality. So overall, that's what we did. Um, now I'll share a little bit of the results that we got. So much to our surprise, we did not see a significant effect of treatment on um, weight gain. So this shows their weight gain over the whole 110-day uh, trial until they were finished. Again, the treatments were only given for the first 40 days of the trial, but um, treatment didn't have any effect on weight gain, um, which isn't what we had hypothesized would happen since the literature tells us that since these animals are mineral deficient, um, they in theory don't perform as well in the feedlot. And we didn't, we didn't see that significant difference here. Um, when we look at average daily gain that was kind of broken down by 14 day pe periods throughout the trial, um, the only time point where we see a difference here is from days 56 to 69 of the trial. So we can see that the animals that received two times the industry level of, of mineral were, uh, they gained more than our animals that received a multi-moon shot. So we didn't see a difference in the, between the control animals that's likely due to the relatively small number of animals. But if you look at these numbers, you can see that overall, those animals that were fed for the first 40 days that were fed two times the level of um, minerals that are fed in the industry, that they gained more um, than our animals that didn't. So you can see, even though we don't have a significant p-value here, you can see if we take the whole trial that those animals gained more than our, than our other groups. And, and interestingly, if we look at industry levels, that's essentially just providing a, a general, like the, the same level of minerals that are provided in the industry. There's no, no, it's nearly the same number as our control. So really adding in that extra mineral really helped with, uh, with gain. One, one thing we need to do is we need to send this data to, a, to an economist, because even though we're not seeing a significant dip difference here. 0.2 pounds of gain per day might be something that is, is significant to a, to a feedlot producer. So we also looked at dry matter intake because they were fed in the grow safe system. So we're able to get individual intakes on all the animals. And what we saw is we saw that those animals that were fed um, twice the industry level of minerals, those had the highest intake compared to our other animals. And then um, those fed the industry level kind of in the middle. And then those um, that served as our control or those that got the multi -min shot, those were a little bit lower. Um, so you can see that what, um, what mineral treatment we had them on, those affected dry matter intake. And so if we're seeing this increased amount of dry matter intake, what we want to make sure is we want to make sure that we're not affecting feed efficiency. So um, the animals that ate the most also gained the most, um, even though, again, it wasn't, it wasn't significant. Um, so what we see is we see no, no difference in feed efficiency. So if we calculate gain to feed and we look at that, we really don't see any, any difference through, um, throughout the trial relative to treatment. We do see an effective time, 
and that's just because feed efficiency changes as the animals grow. But um, we don't see an effect of our treatment. So even though one treatment caused the animals to eat a little bit more, they gained a little bit more also. So our, our, our feed efficiency kind of evened out there. So uh, then we looked at liver mineral levels. And so we didn't um, see a huge effect on overall performance of the animals with our treatments. What we did see in terms of liver mineral status was really, really interesting. So what you can see here is, um, so we'll kind of point out our, um, our different treatments here. So our control is this one here that you see on the bottom. So it makes sense that we didn't supplement them with minerals, so their liver copper kind of stayed fairly constant. The, those that we supplemented with industry level of mineral orally, it, you can see that it took it took some time, but eventually these animals started to increase their, their mineral status. So you can see there's that increase there. Um, those that we gave multi-min to, so you can see that they kind of peaked early on and then they leveled out after that time point because after that shot, we didn't supplement any oral mineral to these animals. And then interestingly, those that we fed twice the industry level of minerals to, they peaked and then they continue to rise throughout the trial. And so um, this line right here re represents what's considered clinically deficient. And so in that 40 days, the only treatment that allowed our animals to get up above that deficient level was um, providing two times the industry level of, of mineral to those animals. So we did the same thing looking at selenium. And so what we saw with selenium is somewhat similar where our control stayed low, um, our industry level increased slightly and then stayed about there. Our two times the industry level of mineral, they, they increased kind of right up to where they're considered, where, where that clinically deficient line is. And then interestingly, our animals that were given a multi-min shot, they peaked and then they started to decrease after that time. Um, so that was, was really interesting to see how um, relatively quickly those selenium levels will peak and then go back down to um, where they're essentially not much higher than our animals that don't receive any mineral after, after 40 days. So our zinc, I mentioned that these animals didn't start out deficient. So again, here's the deficient line right here. Um, and we kind of saw an increase in all of our treatments and then a, and then a, a decrease in some. Um, so we didn't really see anything as far as treatment goes with zinc. So that was, that was kind of surprising for us because we know that zinc is really important in growing animals. And so um, we assumed if we had fed more zinc that we would see kind of some changes in this and we're not, we're not really seeing that with zinc. But then again, these animals didn't start out deficient in zinc. And so that could be why, why we're not seeing this change. But it is also important to note here that the animals that received multi-min or the control, um, that they eventually, the zinc amount fell in those animals when they weren't receiving um, a, a supplement. So with that 2X industry level, that's the only treatment where they stayed above that, that deficient line throughout the first 40 days of this trial. All right, so we also measured immune response and we measured two of the, the different path, pathogens that are commonly found in bovine respiratory disease. And so we looked at BPIV3 and um, we did see an effective treatment, but when we start to look at the average antibody titers for these over time, um, we really don't see kind of a whole, a whole lot of anything going on. Um, we do see that the control animals kind of, their, their antibody titer peaked around day 40, which um, you can also see the standard errors here are really high. So th this might just be kind of a fluke or an anomaly in the data. But, but largely um, the immune response to this specific path pathogen wasn't affected by treatment. 
And we also looked at this pet pathogen, BHV, and we can also see that it wasn't affected by, by treatment. So we see that these animals kind of start to develop somewhat of immunity and then it kind of goes back down after a period of time. But there's really no effect of our treatment on, on this. So the last thing we looked at is our carcass data. So when we sent these animals to harvest, we didn't see, uh, we saw a tendency for um, hot carcass weight to be impacted. So our animals that received twice the industry level of mineral had a higher hot carcass weight than those that received uh, multi-min. So again, that was a tendency, it wasn't significant. Um, but we didn't see any differences in marbling score or ribeye area or back fat thickness, um, yield grade, or the marbling to back fat ratio, which is essentially a measure of how efficiently they put on intramuscular fat or marbling as opposed to, to back fat. So it essentially looks at efficiency of fat, fat deposition, so how much useful fat they put on relative to how much waste fat, such as back fat. Um, so we didn't really see we didn't really see a difference there um, between our animals, but numerically those that received twice the industry level of minerals had the highest hot carcass weight. Um, they also had the highest marbling score, um, which is why I think it'd be interesting to to do some economic analysis on this. All right, so some of the conclusions, kind of the take home from our our study is that these different mineral supplementation strategies didn't have an effect on feedlot performance or carcass quality in marginally mineral deficient cattle. And so again, their, their weight, their feed efficiencies, um, their overall carcass quality, it wasn't significantly affected. Um, so the multi-min shot provides an initial peak in liver mineral concentrations, but that's largely gone after 20 days. So you can't give that multi-min shot and expect them to be covered throughout the feedlot period. So you need to ideally give them multi-min shot and then continue to supplement with mineral after that. Um, feeding two times the industry level of mineral increased mineral status the most for the longest period of time. Um, so it was more consistent, more long-term increase. And we didn't see any large effects on immune status there are still um, three more pathogens that Dr. Bart Harbert is going to look at for us. Um, fortunately or unfortunately depends on how you how you look at it. But um, right as Dr. Tarbit's lab started to look at these things, uh, that's when they also got a large contract grant from the NIH to start researching um, COVID-19. So his lab has been focused on that. And as a result, some of this immune response stuff has been pushed back to the, the back burner. So I, um, if your research has to get put, pushed back, at least it's for something as important as that. So I mentioned that we're going to replicate this study. Um, so in the future, what we're planning to do, and if any of, of you have any input, I'd be really interested in hearing it. Um, we're going to get some uh, some calves that have a larger mineral deficiency. So we're going to get some calves from down in southern Utah that come off the, the Arizona Strip, so more, um, more high risk than the animals we actually use. So we're going to get these animals and then we're going to obviously stress them by trucking them from southern Utah. They're going to be younger and so they're going to be more um, more susceptible to the stress and we're going to we're essentially going to replicate the study again but I think what we're going to do is we're going to add a treatment where we inject the animals with multi-min and we provide additional mineral to them because um, just based off what we saw with this trial I think that if we can give them a multi-min shot and then also provide two times industry level of minerals, then we will be able to, to see more of a long-term increase in mineral status of, of those animals. And then hopefully um, when we get these animals, they'll all be more mineral deficient. And so we can see how these different treatments really impact um, 
or if they impact VBOT performance and, and carcass quality. So just a couple of kind of quick acknowledgements. Um, I wanna make sure to thank Tevin Brady. So he's the master student who's working on this project. Um, so he, he has done a ton of work for this um, in this project. And then my collaborators, Dr. Carrie Rue, Dr. Matt Garcia, Dr. Bart Tarbett, and then Dr. Um, Jeff Hall at the VDL, at the um, Veterinary Diagnostic Lab also helped with some of the initial, initial work here. And then um, this work was funded by the, by the Western Therapy.